In Islington, we're facing many challenges. We have a cost of living crisis. We have a housing crisis. Precarious and low paid work puts pressure on the entire local community. With no help from the government, people are seeking alternative ways of helping each other. There is another way of doing things. I'm meeting these people to find out exactly how. Tell us, how was Wings set up and who did it? So it came together with a collective of former delivery riders like myself, inspired really by our own experiences of working for Deliveroo. Working for Deliveroo, you get the experience day to day of restaurant owners angry with you for kind of rushing through. You get residents who won't even look at you in the eye as you pass them by. So when you see a delivery rider waiting on the pavement, sitting, staring at their phone, they're not actually making any money at all. So you're just sitting there waiting, often for hours at a time, for an algorithm to assign you an order to make a few pounds. And you literally don't even know whether you're going to make enough money to pay your bills at the end of the day. And we'd all been in that situation countless times. On top of that, you're an independent contractor, not a full employee. So you have no guaranteed minimum wage, no sick pay, no insurance if something goes wrong on the road, as it often does. So we really came together and it was from a point of view of, kind of mutual care and mutual support. We thought if anyone's going to do something about this, it has to be us. So we decided that we could really change that by taking control of the business, empowering ourselves, paying ourselves fairly at a guaranteed London living wage, by controlling what restaurants we work with, and by ensuring that we're there for each other when something does go wrong, when someone gets a puncture on the road, when someone's sick and can't work. So yeah, it came together from that perspective. And in the initial stages, we were just a group of disgruntled former delivery riders. We came on board, we had conversations with some great councillors within Islington um, who really got on board with the project and helped us see it as something that wasn't just about riders, that it was also about the community. How much do they get per delivery? Well, they can fluctuate from place to place and that's one of the problems. But generally it's two or three pounds a delivery. And that can take how long a delivery? It can be anywhere up to, up to half an hour right. or longer. I mean, there's, there was a study done where they found that riders, some riders were getting as little as £2.50 an hour on average. But it varies. At peak times, you can get much more than minimum wage. And that's what they use to kind of sell this. But really, yeah, there's no guarantees. So sort of seven to eight on a Friday night, you might earn quite a lot of money. Yeah. But every other evening, you won't get very much. Exactly. And that's how they sell it to people who are often marginalised from most formal employment. They say you can make far more than the kind of minimum wage you're making elsewhere. And you can for one hour a week. Now, Deliveroo and Uber Eats make a lot of money. They are very profitable businesses. Your co-op is different. How much you pay and how does it work? And how successful is it so far? Well, I'd actually start off by saying that Deliveroo and Uber Eats aren't profitable. They're bankrolled by venture capital millions, hundreds of millions of pounds. Without, like, without ever turning a profit. Uber Eats have never turned a profit. Deliveroo have never turned a profit. Just Eat have never turned a profit. So what they do is they get all of this seed funding, funding on the premise that if they grow aggressively enough, if they cut their labor costs enough, if they can recruit enough consumers through kind of predatory pricing, that then in the future they'll be able to expand enough, knock off all the competition, if you're Uber choke out traditional transport infrastructure, and then once you've got that monopoly, then you can start turning a profit. Right. So these companies aren't even doing that. It's not even financially sustainable. We're against these companies whose marketing budgets put them on the England shirt, whose ads are plastered all over the underground. So we've really had to turn to this community. I mean, Wings was born and bred in Islington. I've lived here all my life, as have a lot of the other riders. And we've really seen a lot of support from the community. And that's really how we've been able to get success so far. It's spreading through those organic community networks. Because what we have that they don't have is authenticity and people really see that. A lot of these giants are, coming, are toppling at the moment. And what co-ops offer is a way of building genuine resilience and community level resistance to that. It allows you to build within the area that you're in or with your fellow workers and build something that 
actually exists. We're really lucky that we're within what is probably the heart of the cooperative movement in the country right now in Islington. Yeah. Yeah. We had a visionary grant from Islington Council to start us off and we're heavily linked with Corporate Islington which is a new pilot project being run here and so we work in a cooperative workspace with Space4 along with other tech co-ops. So there's that ecosystem of co-ops that we're within and we share knowledge, we share knowledge about things like raising funds are cooperative, which is notoriously difficult. So really, I mean, building a co-op is easy in one sense, but it's also easy because you're part of this wider community. That's what it's about. Communities, relationship, working together. Ben, thank you very much for sharing your time with us today. We're here on the Andover in the community centre and we're bringing Cooperation Town to the Andover. Well, I don't need to welcome you because you've been here for yonks, but what does bringing Cooperation Town to the Andover mean for the people here? So, shall we share, say what Cooperation Town is? It's a network of community food co-ops. So that means neighbours coming together to organise wherever they live on their estate, on their street, around churches and mosques and community centres um, and buying food together. So basically pooling our money together, small amounts every week, that is affordable for all members. Uh, and with that money, buying food in bulk. And in addition to that, because we are organised in our communities, we're not just individuals, we're doing it together. We can also access surplus food from supermarkets and from markets and from this came from some luxury restaurants. It's for anyone watching this that doesn't really understand what a food co-op is, I think their first question is going to be, how much does it cost? Do I have to stay in it forever if I don't like it? And three, what powers do I have in it for buying food? So, so how does it all work? So a co-op is by definition run by its own members. Yep. So it is the members, the people, the neighbours who buy the food together that decide on all of those things. We as an organisation just support people to come together. Uh, we might give some tips, we might have some experience, but it is up to the members and they develop the skills to make those decisions and make all the decisions together. So how much does it cost to be in a co-op is up to the members. They can decide how much they want to put into their own co-op. They don't pay us and they don't pay uh, anyone else. It's just their own money pooled together. Most co-ops pay between three and five pounds a week uh, and they can buy, you know, uh, however much uh, fruit and veg, toilet paper, those kind of basics, rice and pasta, the things that everyone needs and everyone uses. Um, and they can take donations as well, presumably, of food and stuff like that, if, they they want, if there is somebody offering it. That's right, so they can get surplus food. So that's the sort of half or, or however much of their weekly kind of supply comes from surplus, from the Felix Project, from Fair Share, and from, yeah, it could be donations from supermarkets or restaurants or neighbours, I don't know, uh, but it's not a food bank. Yep. So there is no sort of giving and receiving relationship. It's people organising together. So it's not you and I standing here and people coming there and we're saying, would you like Definitely six carrots not. or whatever? It's me saying, it's you're in the co-op. you and me. As the co-op saying. And our neighbours. Saying, saying, we're deciding this week with our five pound or three pound that we pulled together, all of us, we want to buy carrots and courgettes and so on. And next week we'll buy something else. Or if you have somebody that can't stand carrots, then you don't buy them. Well, if you have somebody that doesn't stand carrots, probably if everyone else did want carrots, they would get more of something else. So uh, there is a lot of re-commoning, it's, it's adding things to the common, it's basically redeveloping the commons. Absolutely, I think it's really great. And how many cooperative town things have been set up so far? So they're all over the country. They're not just in Islington, sure. not just in London. Uh, there are about 19 or 20 groups. There are some that we don't know about because people can organise wherever they are. They don't need us to tell them what to do because they already know probably how to buy food. But uh, they might want a support, a support with uh, marketing, with a bit of promotion, how to speak to your neighbours, that kind of stuff. Um, and there are at the moment three in Islington. This is the third one um, and hopefully many more. 
Brilliant. Now, we're together in a co-op. I suppose it's you and me and... What sort of size of it would a cooperative be? How many people? It would be 20 households, so 20 members. Uh, and that's because we want to make sure that in a co-op everyone gets heard, everyone gets a say. Uh, we don't want it to be really, really large groups where some voices are louder and some people don't feel confident to speak. Um, and we also want everyone to be able to do something in a co-op, because like I said, they're run by their members. So somebody is um, keeping the lease, the list of neighbours, somebody is going to the shop, somebody is opening the space. Everyone's got a role. 20 families, you could be about maybe 100 people? Yeah, it could be about 70, anyway. 100 people, yeah. yeah. That's good. Now, when 70 or 100 people come together, or just 20 for that matter, who've um, obviously feel the need to access a co-op, and that's good, they can have other issues as well. So. I think bringing people together to share problems. Yeah. A problem shared is a problem halved, yeah. but it also gives people some some confidence, I think. It's Do you find that. that as the experience? It is actually very much about that. So food is important and we all need to eat. And this is the reason that we organize around food is that it's a very accessible and essential uh, issue to organize around. But it is about developing confidence as organizers in our communities. We're not just, um, you know, neighbors we're not just citizens we're not just consumers we are all community organizers and this is what the co-ops do and we know already that people organizing co-ops then start organizing in other things and the, the list is endless i mean we have terrible landlords all of us we have terrible bosses to gain the confidence to organize around those kind of more risky issues like our, our work and our housing yeah you, you develop that in the food co-op and you know, in this borough, there's probably more housing co-ops than any other part of the country. Historically, from the um, tenants movement in the 1970s, set up housing co-ops. And as the MP for the area, I'm always impressed by the small number of problems that ever brought to me from people in housing co-ops compared to people who are in a traditional landlord-tenant relationship in the private sector or somewhere else. And so I, I see the value of it all the way. I think it's fantastic, this. Well, they're all free. So, you know, a lot of people ask us, oh, is it going to be all organic? And we're like, no, it's going to be whatever people want to eat. But if we get amazing, you know, extras for free, yeah, we all should get nothing too good for the working class. Well done, well done you. Well, well, done. well done, the neighbours. Well done, Andover. Can we hear it for the Andover? Big it up for the Andover. Woo! Yeah. <laughs>
but more importantly, I have visibility. And Atlantis, of course, is supported by the council. Yeah, but they've helped me. So I've got visibility physically, and then Atlantis has helped me have visibility online, where everybody is now. They have literally changed my whole life, my whole business, to make me feel very empowered that I can stand here today and have you know the confidence you to speak to you. Others. <laughs> there we have it. Anna, the empowerer. Anna, the inspiration. Anna, the voice of Africa and the Caribbean. Here at Space4 we provide all sorts of things to local businesses and freelancers and community groups. We have affordable workspace, so it's pay what you can for use of the workspace, so you can take a desk for a day or permanently and you can just pay as much as you think is reasonable for your income. We also provide free training, so we train people in digital skills and we train people in how to set up small businesses. Um, in particular, we focus on how to set up cooperatives. And on top of that, we run a program of public events. Um, usually those focus on some kind of intersection of tech and activism because we, we're really about you know, promoting technology and technology careers. But we also do events around employment, the economy, how women can get into roles in the tech industry and that kind of thing. How does this differ from a privately owned uh, workspace where people pay, use and go? I think we're different from most privately owned workspaces because we really are about trying to forge relationships in the yeah. community and try to actually sort of play a role in the success of all the organisations and the individuals who are based here, whether they're using the space or whether they're just popping in. Sure, we want to be sustainable and we are sustainable, but we're not about trying to make profit. Mm -hmm. And we're also supported by Islington Council, which is, as you know, like a great help and means that we can deliver lots of these services more affordably. For us, if somebody can't pay us in money, but they can, for example, do a bit of volunteering, either for us or for another organisation here, then that's just as valuable if, if... Well, they sort of build up credits, you mean. So you sort of say, well, you can't pay because you haven't got any money, but if you can help this co-op grow or whatever it is, yeah. then you, you let them do that. Exactly. So we ask everybody when they join what kind of skills they've got and what capacity they've got to deliver um, some extra things like free workshops, or it might even just be having a coffee with somebody in the space who wants to learn more about the sector they work in. And we also have a policy of trying to get everyone to refer work to each other. So last time I counted it up, it was £7 million worth of work had been circulated amongst people here. So, for example, if somebody heard about a job, um, like a, a contract, but they weren't able to do it or they weren't able to do it alone, we ask them to, first of all, seek other people in the space who might be able to help them do that. So it's about trying to, as well as provide a workspace, almost as well, you know, really provide like, business opportunities. And a lot of the culture around entrepreneurialism can be a bit individualistic yeah. and quite, you know, you can be quite secretive because you wouldn't want somebody to Ooh, steal your idea or steal a client from you and here we're really trying to buck, buck that trend and go against the grain in that regard and get everyone to foster the sense of openness and transparency and a feeling that if, we all, if one of us succeeds we all, we all succeed. So message then to anyone forming a co-op, simple advice. First of all, I think it's about thinking what it is that you want to do, what services or goods do you want to be delivering and having a think about, is there somebody who's going to buy those things from you? It's important, I think, to remember that co-ops are about trading. They're not, they're not just charities. They're not just about trying to get money from 
funders and foundations and then deliver charitable services. Of course, some co-ops do get some funding as well, but they are about creating a robust trading model. So I'd say have a deep think about that and also think about your values and what you want to be um, committing to through your values. So that could be around the workers, it could be about the people who you're delivering goods and services to, it could be about other stakeholders because there's lots of different ways to structure your co-op. So have a good think about those, but then just get in touch and speak to people. I mean, one of the nice things about co-ops is that it's actually in our nature and in our rules that we have to cooperate with each other. So you can basically telephone any, any co-op and ask them for some advice and they'll give it to you and they'll be happy to because that's what we like doing. So there's us, um, there's co-op development agencies in um, a few different boroughs. There's Co-ops UK who have some advice and support. But just come along, meet people, learn from other people what, what the successes are, what, what they've struggled with. And I think just don't overthink it. I always think just start small and try and you're bound to make mistakes, but that's kind of part of the fun. It's a cooperative future. It is a cooperative future. You were the cabinet member in the council that promoted community wealth building and cooperatives. How did you persuade the council to put its money into this? So the first stage was securing funding from the Mayor of London to establish a space, this space, Space 4. We bought a long lease, 10 years, uh, with that money and we were able to support Outlandish to develop space for and in return for rent-free premises they uh, will, will deliver social value and social benefit in return. That would we encounter a number of things. One is reaching out into the community to encourage local residents to come and use this space. Really important key factor is the work that Founders and Coders does in the training room which is that they will uh, offer apprenticeships, they work with our adult community learning service to leverage in residents to uh, improve their tech digital skills because we want people to go into high paying jobs. Yeah. So the second stage was that we, we've added an employment dimension because another strand of community wealth building is about people. Um, how, do you, how do you help people get an income and uh, you know, engage with the economy? And um, the, the third strand is around procurement and etc. The fourth strand of community wealth building is own, who, who owns the economy, who's got a stake in the economy. So that's why cooperatives were really important. And we thought, well, we've got a number of cooperatives. What's our ambition? Our ambition is to double the number of cooperatives in the next four years. If you have a small number, that's not a very, you know, a great amount. But we thought we, we have to start somewhere. So that's when we thought, well, Post-Covid, we had dedicated resources to put into businesses and we decided as a council that we wanted to build back differently, mm -hmm. uh, build back fairer. And what did that mean? That, that didn't just mean putting money back into businesses and in the, in the economy as it was, because, you know, that's just things going back to as they were before. But we thought, well, how can we make a difference? Well, what we could do is use that money for small businesses to support cooperatives. And so that's when we put in a considerable pot of money to set up a cooperative development agency. And that's where the community benefit, we, benefit comes in. What political challenges did you face in trying to get this through your council? At the moment, councils are being asked to make money. For some officers, this was so socialist because we've taken public money just to give to people. So it did take a while to persuade officers to um, support a cooperative development agency. Is that because council officers are trained in this idea of a council having an internal market, etc., etc.? It is. Rather than the idea of a creative collective whole? Well, it's the, it's the wider paradigm of the private sector. Mm. 
and the logic of the benefit of the private sector mm. and just supporting businesses. And it's trying to convince officers that cooperatives are also businesses, but they, uh, but their logic is, uh, is a more equal and fairer one, and that is just as valid. And I must say that we, um, we were able to support a cooperative development agency because there was a wider leadership support. I remember um, I, was, I was coming against a brick wall and I just went to the cabinet at Islington and I just said, you know, I think we, it'd be a great idea that we set up a cooperative development agency. And unanimously everybody said, yes, that's there what we go. want to do. So being able to then take that back to officers meant this is what we want to do as a council. So you could say this is politically agreed by the leadership of your council yes. and this is what you've got to deliver. Yeah, and everybody was so excited, saying it, we de that's, that's definitely what we want to be doing in Islington. Will this work everywhere else? Absolutely it will work everywhere else. Um, I think if, if, you know, we'll be happy to share this model with other local authorities. Co-ops are where it's at. Yes, definitely. Whether it's beating global corporations at their own game for better paying conditions or fighting the cost of living by coming together locally, the people of Islington are helping each other to thrive. All this has been made possible by a cooperative already leading the way and a council who gave them all the space and the support they needed to help others. So, if you're inspired by this story, then ask your council how they support community wealth building and cooperatives, or maybe even start one of your own. Mm -hmm.